Act 3, Scene 5 opens in a deserted place. Thunder. Enter the three witches meeting Hecate. This scene was added after Shakespeare's death, presumably for its entertainment value because the witches were such a big hit with the audiences of the time. We can tell that it was written by someone else because not only does it add nothing to the plot, but the quality of the verse is also noticeably inferior. It's written in rhyming couplets of regular iambic tetrameter, didum, 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 which is an uncharacteristic metre for Shakespeare to choose. Not only for his characters in general, who tend to speak in either blank verse, i.e. unrhymed lines of iambic pentameter, didum, 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 or prose, but also for the witches in particular, who in Act 4, Scene 1, will speak in a mixture of trochaic tetrameter, dumpty, 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 and trochaic tetrameter catalectic, dumpty, 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 dum. And as such, the verse in this scene comes across as though it has been written for a pantomime. The three witches have been summoned by Hecate, their queen. The first witch seems surprised that she looks cross. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily. It turns out that she has every right to be, as the witches have been toying with Macbeth with neither her say-so nor her involvement. Have I not reason, Baldams, as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? What is worse is that they have done all this for someone who only cares about magic in so far as it is beneficial to themselves. And which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, love for his own ends, not for you. Determined to get in on the act, she dismisses them by telling them that she has much evil business to perform that night in order to conjure wicked sprites or spirits that, by the strength of their illusion, shall draw him in to his confusion, to give him a false sense of security, so that he shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. Here she is clearly alluding to the apparitions that will appear to Macbeth in Act 4, Scene 1, and the way they present him with equivocal prophecies, which he will mistakenly go on to interpret as being favourable to himself. This explanation to the audience of what will happen is completely unnecessary and takes away from the impact of the denouement in Act 5, as we realise the terrible truth at the same time as Macbeth. After a song, Come Away, Come Away, which was probably taken from Thomas Middleton's play The Witch, written sometime between 1613 and 1616, they exit. Act 3, Scene 6 opens somewhere in Scotland. Enter Lennox and another lord. In this scene, we momentarily step away from Macbeth to get a view on what is being said about him behind closed doors, as well as to get an update on what Malcolm and Macduff have been up to, in order to set up the action for Act 4. It's not looking good for Macbeth. Lennox, who, remember, was not five minutes ago giving the performance of his life as a faithful subject at Macbeth's banquet, and this unnamed lord, are discussing what's been going on. Note how Lennox introduces the topic. My former speeches have but hit your thoughts which can interpret further. Only, I say, things have been strangely born. In other words, he says, even though they are both of the same mind, they haven't really got down to the nitty-gritty yet, which is that the series of events that have unfolded just don't add up. Although what he goes on to say at the beginning of his speech seems to suggest that he is sticking to the official version of events, in light of his introductory comments, we need to imagine that his tone is anything but genuine, and as such, 
The sarcasm with which he speaks tells us that he, for one, is not fooled by Macbeth's dissembling. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Marry, he was dead. And the right valiant Banquo walked too late. Whom you may say, if it please you, Fleance killed, for Fleance fled. Men must not walk too late. The way he repeats almost mechanically the phrase, walk too late, and his choice of the subjunctive mood, whom you may say, if it please you, which signals a hypothetical scenario, makes it clear that he's just not buying any of it. Lennox's rhetorical questions here drip with sarcasm as he comments on Macbeth's reaction to Malcolm and Donald Bain's monstrous patricide. Who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donald Bain to kill their gracious father? Damned fact, how it did grieve Macbeth. Did he not straight in pious rage the two delinquents tear that were slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was that not nobly done? The epithet pious means devoutly religious and suggests that the retribution he nobly wrought on the guards was motivated by his rage that God's representative on earth had been brutally assassinated by his sons. By sarcastically attributing the purest of motives to Macbeth, however, he is actually doing the very opposite. He sees that the whole thing has been an elaborate plan by Macbeth to stitch Malcolm and Donald Bain up for the murder, and then, in a fit of so-called uncontrollable vengeance, to expediently remove the only ones who could provide testimony against this because, he says, tongue-in-cheek, it would have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it. Yes, he says, he has borne all things well i.e. he has staged managed everything superbly to the extent that if he had Duncan's sons under his key, as, and it please heaven, he shall not, they should find what twere to kill a father. In other words, if he had Malcolm and Donald Bain imprisoned, they would suffer for their crimes with their brutal deaths, as would Fleance, for killing his own father Banquo. He now switches his attention to Macduff, who, because he has been publicly bad-mouthing Macbeth and because he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear he lives in disgrace. Note how, with his description of Macbeth as a tyrant, the sarcasm has now vanished and he is speaking bluntly. The Lord, who has inside knowledge of what is going on, responds in kind, also referring to Macbeth as this tyrant, who, he says, is denying Malcolm, now living in the English court, his birthright. Malcolm has, he says, been received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from this high respect. In other words, the King of England, Edward the Confessor, known for his religious devotion and clearly believing that Malcolm is not responsible for his father's death, has not held his current problems against him in the slightest. Macduff has also made his way to England to make the case to the King for mustering armies against Macbeth so that they can go back to how life was before. So we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights. Free from our feasts and banquets, bloody knives. Do faithful homage and receive free honours, all which we pine for now. It seems that his suit has been successful, and this report hath so exasperate their king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Macbeth, however, is fully aware of what Macduff is up to, as when Macbeth sent for him, so the Lord reports, he sent back with an absolute sir, not I, which is verging on treasonous, the sentence for which would be death. Lennox remarks, and that well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. In other words, that should be a warning for him to stay as far away from Macbeth as he can. The pair exit. Thanks for watching. 
If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.